October the 23rd, 2022, and I'm so glad that you're joining us here for a message from the First United Methodist Church of Interlochen. Folks, again, I just want to thank you for sake, taking some of your valuable time and taking the time to listen to this message to help you grow in your faith. You know, Scripture says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So the more we read the Word of God, the more we hear the Word of God taught and preached, the more we'll grow in our faith. Just like we water a plant and fertilize it to have it grow, we water ourselves with the Word of God and with the presence of the Holy Spirit, God helps us to grow in our faith. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin this morning and ask His blessing. Father, thank you so much for the gift of life, and thank you even more abundantly so for the gift of eternal life, that we can have a personal relationship with you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you that we're not just people following a system of rules or laws, but we're people who walk with you each day, feel your joy, and sense your presence. And thank you so much for being with us this morning. Father, I pray you would fill me with the Holy Spirit, you would fill those listening with the Holy Spirit, and we'd be able to understand your word and what you have for us today. Father, thank you so much for life and all you do for us. In Christ's name, amen. When I was a young boy growing up, I remember on the television, Smokey the Bear. And if you've got a little bit of time on you, a little few years, you'll remember Smokey the Bear. Smokey the Bear, Smokey the Bear. Howlin' and growling and sniffing the air. He can smell a fire before it even starts to flame. That's why they call him Smokey. That's how he got his name. And Smokey the Bear was basically a informational cartoon that they would flash to warn people about forest fires. I remember the saying that one tree can make a million matches, but only one match can burn a million trees. So many times we can see that something amazing can come from one small deed, one small act. Sadly, I think about the deadly impact of the COVID-19 virus and how one small virus originating in Wuhan, China in an experimental lab basically became a pandemic all over the entire world of our times. A virus that couldn't even be seen but think how impactful it was. Amazing things can come from one small deed. You know, I never have really learned how to play the game of dominoes. But one thing I did do as a boy was I liked building a domino train to go in different angles. And then after I got the whole thing set up, I would stand back and touch one domino and be excited as I saw one domino hit each other domino to knock the whole domino train over by the effect of one little flip of the finger. Truly, God can do amazing things from one small deed. And if you would, I'd like to ask you to turn in your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 5. Last week we talked from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 12, about Peter's miraculous deliverance from prison. And now we're going to go back into the Old Testament and look at 2 Kings chapter 5, to look at an incident that happens back here where God shows up in a mighty way through one small significant deed. Acts, excuse me, 2 Kings chapter 5, we're going to begin at verse 1. 2 Kings 5. Scripture tells us here in verse 1, it says, Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. Aram is another name for Syria, which was the kingdom that was directly north over top of Israel. He was the commander of the army of the king of Aram. It says he was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, and here's the reason, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. God had given victory to Syria. You might ask yourself, well, why would God give victory to Syria over Israel, over his own people. Well, often God would use foreign nations in the Old Testament to chasten his people, to get their attention. 
God used the Assyrian Empire throughout time to come down and chase in Israel to try to get their attention to turn back to God and repent of their sins. God also used the Babylonian Empire in the history of Israel again to try to get their attention and get them to come back to the covenant, come back to doing what God told them to do in the Old Testament. And God is the one that gave Aram and gave Syria the victory uh, over Israel at this time. So this is a mighty man. You know, you think of somebody like Colin Powell, who was the chief of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was the head of our military at that time. Very, very famous man. He's the commander of the army because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, strategic. He knew what to do. He knew how to command his troops, and he knew how to have victory. But he had a problem. He had leprosy, it tells us in verse 1. Folks, I don't care how high you get up on the social scale. I don't care how economically well off you are. I've never met a person that didn't have a problem. Problems are native to our lives. We all have to deal with difficulties and problems. And the problem's name it has is leprosy. Some type of an infectious skin disease which caused him a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. You know, the term leprosy back in those days is used to, to refer to all kinds of different skin diseases. So we don't exactly know what uh, specific disease it was, but if it was leprosy, his skin would turn white and parts of his extremities would become numb and eventually even slough off. Even today, over like in the Philippines and the Far East, there are leper colonies where people that have leprosy have to isolate themselves. So he's got a problem that he's dealing with, causing him all kinds of difficulties. And although he has a high position in the Syrian government as the commander of the army, has the favor of the king, he's dealing with this health issue, this health problem. Now verse 2 tells us that bands from Aram, bands from Syria, had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. You know, in the ancient Near East, it was common for people to invade another country and take some of the inhabitants of that country and turn them into slaves. And here's a young Israelite girl who was captured down in Israel, taken north to Aram, to Syria, where she is basically made a slave to Naaman's wife, and she has to basically do her bidding. Sadly, she's a slave in bondage. She's young from what the scripture tells us. She's away from her family. I'm sure she's going through some really tough times. Okay? But look what she does in verse 3. This young maiden, it says, She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. You know what I like about this young girl? She shares her faith in God. She shares her faith in Yahweh, in Jehovah, the one true God, and she knows there's a prophet in Samaria living in the northern part of Israel and that if Naaman went to him, he could be healed. She shares an encouraging, comforting word even though she's living in a set of circumstances which are completely against her. You know she had to miss her family. You know she had to miss her brothers and sisters and her parents, her mom and dad. But apparently her mom and dad had encouraged her in her faith. She had grown in her faith. And she has a heart of compassion toward her master and realizes God could do him some real good. So she takes the time to speak. If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. This one young servant girl, this one young Israelite girl, is the domino that sets the whole effect of this chain of this chapter in motion. Folks, you never know how something you see is very insignificant could have such a significant impact. A word of encouragement to somebody as you're sitting in the doctor's office, a word of kindness spoken to a clerk at the grocery store at Walmart or Winn-Dixie, giving somebody a smile, doing something kind, especially taking the opportunity like this young girl did to share her faith and belief in Jesus Christ. I know a man that I know real well every time that he's going to pray at a restaurant when he's having a meal, 
he'll ask the waiter if there's something he can pray for for her while he's praying over the meal. And you'd be surprised how people are so open to have them pray for them over some issue they're dealing with in their life. One small, significant event, insignificant event we see, God can use in a mighty way to multiply and create a lot of good that can come from that one small thing. Just like one match can burn a million trees, okay? One word of kindness, one good deed can have such a lasting impact. No doubt she tells her mistress about this. She tells Naaman's wife. What's Naaman's wife going to tell him? She's going to tell Naaman. So what does Naaman do? Naaman went to his master. That would be the king of Aram, the king of Syria, and told him what the girl from Israel had said. Well, remember the king has a good relationship with Naaman. So he says in verse 5, By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I'll even send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten cents, excuse me, ten sets of clothing. Now this is phenomenal what he, what he takes. He takes about a 750 pounds of silver and 150 pounds of gold and ten sets of clothing. Now no doubt this just wasn't blue jeans and t-shirts he was taking. He was taking some probably very expensive fine garments, uh, the Pierre Cardin, so to speak, of the day, the Vera Wang things, all the name brands that we hear, expensive clothing. That's what he takes, and that was normal for ambassadors and people that interacted between countries to exchange gifts with one another. Uh, ambassadors from different countries will bring gifts to President Biden. And often American ambassadors will give gifts to ambassadors from other countries as a sign of goodwill and as a sign of friendship. So he's doing that, taking all these things with him uh, in order to be able to get his healing affected and show a gift of kindness for what's going to be done for him. Ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. And the letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter, I'm sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. Notice he's looking to the king, the king of Syria, to the king of Israel saying, I want you to take care of this matter for him. He doesn't realize it's the prophet that's going to do the work. He thinks it's the king that's going to do the work. Now look how the king of Israel reacts in verse 7. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes. That's a sign of mourning, a sign of, 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 of deep sorrow about something that's happening. People generally tore their clothes when there was a death in the family or something bad was going on in the nation or there was a famine, something like that. They would tear their clothes as a sign of deep sorrow. He tore his robes and he said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? I can't heal this guy, okay? Uh, why does this fellow send someone to, to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. King of Israel is not even on a spiritual plane at all. All he's on is a physical plane, and all he can think about is that maybe the king of Aram is trying to do this to start some kind of a battle or a war so he can come back in and invade Israel, take more plunder, take more slaves, take more wealth, and confiscate things. He can only see on an international plane. And folks, we cannot look to man when we have a problem. We have to take that problem to God. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. We've got to take it to the Lord and not man. Politicians can't save us. Only God can save us. So he was only thinking on a level and everything like that. But luckily Elisha comes in here in verse 8 to help out. When Elisha, the man of God, look how he's, he is known as a man of God, a prophet, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Uh, have this man come to me and he will know that there's a prophet in Israel. Hey, you can't help him, the king can't, but God can help him, 
Have him come to me so that he might know there's a prophet in Israel, a man of God, a spokesman for God, a man who can get him help from God to solve his dilemma. Verse 9. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots. Notice the plural there. Many horses, many chariots. No doubt he has an entourage uh, going with him. Just like when President Biden goes somewhere, he has Secret Service agents all around him to protect him. He has a group of people that go with him, people that help him, his assistants. Sometimes he takes his wife, Jill, with him. But he'll be surrounded by Secret Service people to protect him from any kind of a possible assassination. So Naaman goes with his uh, entourage here. He went with his horses and chariots, and he stopped at the door of Elisha's house. No doubt with all those horses galloping, all those chariots rolling, Elisha probably heard them coming from a distance, and he knew they were going to be there. Just like you and I can hear trucks miles away when they're coming because they're so loud, or you hear that guy with his radio cranked up as high as he can get it, boom, 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 as he drives on the road by your house. Elisha hears this, and he's prepared. So look what he does here in verse 10. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be clean. Notice the command. Go wash yourself seven times. What is seven? The biblical number of completion, the biblical number of perfection. Remember, on the seventh day, God rested. So by the power of God, doing something that God would have him to do, that's how he's going to be healed, by washing in the Jordan River. We know how significant the Jordan River is in the history of Israel. Jesus, later on in time, after this event, went to be baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. And as John the Baptist saw him coming, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's what Jesus would do when he died on the cross. He would pay for our sins and take that penalty upon himself. The nation of Israel had to cross the Jordan River to get into the promised land from the other side, the east side of the Jordan. And remember when the priest's foot hit the water, they stepped out on faith, the Jordan River ceased to roar, and they walked through on dry ground, just like they did the Red Sea during the time of the Exodus. So go wash in the Jordan seven times, your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. Seems like a really simple request, doesn't it? But look with me, if you would, at verse 11. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me, stand and call on the name of the Lord as God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of leprosy. Folks, Naaman had a problem that you and I often have. We get mad at God when God doesn't do something the way we think he should. God might answer our prayer, but it might not be the way we wanted our prayer answered. God might do something that causes us to get angry and mad at God. You know, here Naaman, I believe, is a very prideful man. After all, he's a commander of the army of the nation of Syria. He has all kind of people that he can order around on a daily basis. He's best buddies with the king. He has the favor of the king to even go down to see the prophet with all this wealth he's bringing. He's used to being in a position of pride and, and pomp and circumstance, as you would say, okay? And here he's being told to go wash in the river. God is doing something absolutely opposite of the way he thinks things ought to be. Don't you and I sometimes get upset with the Lord if he doesn't do things the way we think he ought to do them? Don't we get angry with the Lord at times when things like that happen? I remember years ago talking to a young correctional officer when I was working as a chaplain in a prison situation. And uh, the officer told me that he used to go to church. He used to go to Penile Baptist Church here in the Black area. But he said after a period of time, his grandfather passed away. And he said, Chapman, I was really close to my granddad. We fished together, spent a lot of time together. 
And after the Lord took him, it just didn't seem the same to me. And I felt like, how could God really love me, yet take my grandfather away? So I kind of quit going to church after that. It's not that he didn't believe in God. He was angry at God for God taking his grandfather. He didn't realize that his grandfather was in a lot of pain, that all of us one day have to pass away. Scripture says it's appointed unto every person to die, and after that, the judgment. We all have to go through the death process. But because he was angry at the Lord, he cut off fellowship with God. And you see that kind of an attitude here. He has three complaints. I thought he would surely come out to me and greet me personally. Remember, I, uh, Elisha just sent a messenger to him, okay? I thought surely he would stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. And then he says in verse 12, Are not Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? We know that the rivers of these two rivers he mentioned were good, clear, clean rivers that flowed into a spot that created a famous big oasis. And that's where the city of Damascus was built because of that water supply to the city. It was good, clear, clean water. He said, I could have been there. Comparative, the Jordan River is a lot smaller and it's muddy. We know the Mississippi River is called the Big Muddy because all the mud that flows through that. The Jordan is muddy at times. And so because of that, he says, couldn't I have washed up there where I was in the waters of the Abana and the Parfar? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and looked closely there, verse 12, went off in a rage. He's mad as a hornet. Why? God didn't do it the way he thought it should be done. The prophet didn't meet him. He didn't wave his hand over him. He didn't pronounce a, a, a blessing or anything like that. He's angry and he goes off away in a rage to be sad and sulk. But praise God, there are people in this world, among many of y'all here in our church, that are encouragers. And you know how to speak to somebody in a time to help them do the right thing. Look what happens here among Naaman's servants in verse 13. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, a term of endearment, you know, trying to settle him down. If the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? You know, settle down, Naaman, look. You know, if he had told you something real hard to do, you would have done it. This is a simple thing. Do what the prophet says and see if it works. Praise God for people who encourage other people to continue with their Christian faith and continue to do the right thing. I love the proverb that says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. A word can make or break somebody's day, and it's so important. Give somebody a compliment on how they're dressed. Give somebody an encouraging word when you see them do something nice for somebody else. Compliment the choir on their songs when they sing. Tell somebody you're glad to see them, that they made it to church today. A word can do so much to lift and encourage and build somebody up. Make sure you're like these encouragers here who tell Naaman to do the right thing and again, use that term of endearment, my father. So what happens? Verse 14, talking about Naaman, it says he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, look, as the man of God had told him. If you do what God said, God promises to honor his word and bless. And look, his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. God did the miracle, but God did it his way, in his time, and in his manner. Naaman had to realize he had to humble himself in order to receive his healing. You know, many people are so prideful, and when you talk about believing in Jesus and trusting him, it sounds too simple. They feel like there's something they've got to do. I've got to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I have to earn my salvation. And God says, no, you can't earn it because you're a sinner.
But just like Naaman had to humble himself to receive his cleansing and his miracle, we have to humble ourselves to be saved. What does Scripture tell us? For by grace you are saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We have to humble ourselves and become like a little child and trust what Jesus did for us in order that we might be saved. Just like he had to humble himself here. And what happens? His flesh becomes clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. They want to go back and thank Elisha for what he did. And here, this is a time when Elisha comes out of the house. He stood before him, Elisha, and said, Now I know there's no God in all the world except in Israel. Naaman comes to faith in the one true God, away from pagan gods, because he met a man of God, he obeyed what the man of God told him, and he received a miracle, and he realized that the God of Israel is the one and only true God. Now I know how through his own personal experience. And you have to experience God for yourself to know that he's there, he exists, and he's willing to bless. Now I know there's no God in all the world except in Israel. And he says, please accept now a gift from your servant. He wants to give Elisha this 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 cents, excuse me, 10 sets of elegant clothing that he had brought as this gift to show thanks and kindness. Now how does Elisha answer? Look at verse 16. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, and notice there are all capitals in your Bible, God's proper name, as sure as Yahweh or Jehovah lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. Why? He wanted Naaman to know that this was a free gift God had done for him. And there was nothing he could give to pay for that gift or to repay the kindness that his healing was totally by the grace of God. And I respect Elisha for that because instead of enriching himself and worrying about his own bank account and how he could profit from what had happened, he says, no, I won't take anything. So you know this is coming directly from you freely from God. And there's nothing you could do to thank him or give anything in return. No payment at all is required. Look what Naaman goes on to say. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, notice how he identifies him now as your servant to the prophet. Instead, before he wanted the prophet to serve him, now he identifies himself as a servant of the prophet. Please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. What does he want to do? He wants to take some of the ground of Israel, some of the actual dirt and sod and load it on the mules, take it up north to Syria where he lives, put that soil down, and build an altar to the one true God. Remember what God told Moses when he met him at the burning bush? Take your sandals off. The place you're standing is holy ground. Naaman wanted to take some holy ground with him from Israel in order to build an altar to sacrifice to the Lord and build his own personal relationship with God. I think that's really cool, you know. So he does that, it says. He said, but may the Lord... He, and he asked a request, okay, after he asked for the, the, the soil. He says in verse 18, But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master, that would be Naaman's master, the king of Aram, the king of Syria, he enters the temple of Rimmon to bow down, and he's leaning on my arm, and I bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. He says, look, I have to do something as part of my ceremony of being a commander. I have to help the king who's elderly go in and bow. So when I take his arm to help him bow down, forgive me for this. What does Elisha say in verse 19? Go in peace. Apparently it was okay to do that. Why, folks, we have to treat people who have different faiths from us, 
different beliefs from us as kind as we possibly can. I don't agree with the Islamic faith, but I'm going to treat Islamic people as kind as I possibly can. I'm not a Hindu or a Buddhist, but if I come into contact with a person who is, I want to treat them as kind and as gracious as I possibly can. Don't reject them. Don't turn away from them. Don't feel better than them or something like that. Realize, try to be Christ to them. Remember the old saying, you can catch more honey, you can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar? A lot of times people say they'll know we are Christians by our love as we sing. Don't let people say they know we're Christians by our shove. we got to make sure we're gracious and kind. That's how we can win people from other faiths to a saving knowledge of Christ. He said it's okay to be gracious and kind to your master. So folks, how important it is to see how one little thing can come, some amazing things can come, from one small deed. No doubt when Naaman got back home, he told his wife, what would she have done? She would have taught all the women in the United Women in Faith group. They would share it with their families. Naaman would share it with his under officers who would share it with their families. And the truth about what happened to him would be a solid gospel witness throughout the whole nation of Syria. Why? One little servant girl in a set of circumstances against herself, no doubt missing her family, stood up and spoke out for the Lord. If only my master would go and see the prophet that's in Samaria. One little act of kindness, one little small thing, something you might see as very insignificant, something you might not even remember you did, can spark and God can use it in a mighty way. After all, didn't he take the five loaves and the two fish of the young boy in the gospel and feed the multitude? Little becomes much when you place it in the master's hands. Speak up for the Lord. Do that little small insignificant act. God can light a fire. You might not ever know what comes of it yourself, but God can use it in a mighty way. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this story in 2 Kings 5 and how powerful the Lord is to heal a man of leprosy, of an infectious skin disease. And Father, help us not to be like Naaman and get mad when you tell us to do something because you're not doing it in the way we think it ought to be done. Help us to yield and humble ourselves to your direction. Father, we put our hope and trust in you and help us look for those opportunities to speak a word of kindness, to share the gospel, Pray for someone and do what you'd have us do. Thank you so much, Father, for your love, your message to us. In Christ's name, amen. Folks, again, I thank you for tuning in and taking the time to listen to me. I know I'm not the greatest preacher that ever lived or the most fantastic pastor that was ever behind the pulpit, but God is using me here, and I praise him and thank him for it. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, next Sunday will be October 30th, and before you know it, Thanksgiving is going to be here. And what many things do you and I both have to give God thanks for? So be blessed, and I look forward to seeing you next week, Sunday, October 30th. Take care.